first start the recording. So yeah, no, that's recording in the background. I hope. Yeah, it's recording. Okay, ready? Okay, cat lang in twenty two in twenty minutes. Let's go. Uh, right. Let's talk about programming languages. They are incredibly complicated messes of the uh, complexity to implement. And if you ever want to make one yourself, you can probably think to yourself, I uh, don't want to deal with all that shit, right? So uh, what we're going to do now in these 20 minutes is basically skip all of these steps I'm not even going to explain because I don't have time. And we're just going to do these three things. We're going to start with our language. We're going to create some bytecode. And then we're going to run that code on a virtual machine. Are all these terms somewhat familiar to you all? Yeah, cool. OK, so how do we skip all these intermediate steps? Well, the best way is to design the language in such a way that maps almost directly to the bytecode. So, uh, so this high-level language to bytecode is basically a catlang, a concatenative language to a stack machine. Yeah, so you may be wondering, what's a stack machine? Well, let's take a look first at this very basic uh, mathematical expression. Uh, if you want to interpret this on a computer, you have to make an abstract syntax tree, and then this tree has to be walked and or either interpreted, or you have to do syntactic analysis and all those things. Um, so let's not do that. We're going to write a diff use a different notation. We're going to use postfix notation, which is also known as reverse Polish notation, or actually it should be called um, Bukasiewicz notation. I hope I pronounced that not terrible. Um, uh, this is like the logic mathematician invented this notation. Uh, you write it like this, 5, 3 plus, 7 multiply. Maybe you've seen this before, maybe not. I'll walk you through it. Uh, what does it do? Basically, first, 5 pushes a number on the stack, in this case 5. Then we go to 3, which pushes a 3 on the stack. So we transform the, like, left is the 5 is the stack, and all right, 5, 3 is the resulting stack. So you get the notation. Uh, the plus then takes the top two stack items, adds them together, and pushes the result. So we transform the 5 and 3 into an 8. Then we push the 7 on the stack, so the stack becomes 8, 7. And then multiply, which I forgot to underline, uh, multiplies the top two stack items and pushes the results. So we get 56. So what's neat is that we now just evaluate from left to right. There are no parentheses, there's no tree, there's no complexity there. And what's also mathematically interesting, which is why this book of Siewicz, uh, was interested in it, is that these can all be considered functions, even the numbers. They take one stack as input and they produce a modified stack as output. Or maybe not even a modified stack if it's like a side effect kind of thing. So if you have like a C-like language and you forget the mathematical operators for a second, then the functions would kind of look like this, right? And if you have a lisp, it will look like this. So Postfix notation is really the most minimal thing you can do. And that's all fun mathematician things uh, on the side, but the real point is that it's just a simple left to right interpretation. You need no trees, no tree walking. And um, that makes your uh, like conversion from your source language to your bytecode a lot simpler. Because at the end of the day, your computer also just like runs step by step through a bunch of code. All right, so functions are fun, but it's not so fun if we can define some ourselves. So here's the notation I came up with. You can come up with a different one. Uh, first of all, in concatenative languages, we tend to call functions words instead, historically speaking. So uh, we can define a word in my language uh, by ending a new name with a colon. And so now we have the word 63. And they are basically expressed as a sequence of other words. So 63, that's the word that does all this stuff before, which actually was wrong. Uh, it's 56. I forgot to update the code. <laughs> so, you know, but that's, that's, that's semiotics, right? Signs don't actually prove anything. Um, and at the end, the, we, can word, um, we can end these word sequences by ending any of the last word with a semicolon. So this, this kind of reads like code you're probably familiar with, except for the postfix stuff, right? And then we can kind of go nuts with refactoring. And for some reason, the font doesn't blow up. Um, but yeah, these are all like refactored words. Um, so let's, let's talk about the mapping to the bytecode from here. 
so we have this 5, 3, plus 7 multiply. Uh, and this box is like one, one opcode, one byte, or bytecode, right? So the first bytecode would be like, okay, this is the literal, so read the next byte as, an, as a number and put it on the stack. So that's like an instruction, the lit. The second is like two bytes, the first being literal, the second one being a three. Then we have another byte, which is the opcode for plus, another literal for seven, and the opcode for multiply. So you can kind of directly map this to a stream of bytes. And then uh, I'm already down to 40 minutes. It's never going to work. But <laughs> um, and then, uh, yeah, we have to get a virtual machine for that. So what also makes the parsing much easier is that you don't need to like think about grammars or syntax things. You can just separate them by spaces because you just read your whole language left to right. You don't need to do anything fancy. So you just say, okay, I separate all my words by white space, and those words are then interpreted. So that makes it a lot simpler. Uh, yeah, you split them by spaces because of my little syntax thing. I say, okay, if this word, this token ends with a colon, then it's a definition. If it ends with a semicolon, it's a return. All right, that's enough prep presentation. I got 30 minutes to implement this little bit of code. All right. Um, so, hello, is this the... I prepared this bit. Um, oh man, this is going to be such a train wreck. <laughs> uh, oh no, uh, it zooms on both both windows, so also my cheat sheet, which is now a super large amount of screen. Um, all right, let's start with the VM, the virtual machine. Okay, I'm going to function. Uh, Primitives are coming late. That's like the, the pluses or the minuses and things, right? We're going to have a size for our memory. Uh, and uh, so our code is going to be uh, an array of, uh, well, let's not use bytes. It's a bit too small. So a new unit array. Um, and then we have a stack, as I mentioned before, right? Uh, I'm just going to make them, uh, it's going to be an int because I have signed numbers. Uh, I'm also going to have a call stack. Um, I'm going to explain this later. I'm going to have a dictionary. Uh, a bunch of primitives, which are like the and uh, the built-in words, and that's it for now. All right. So the virtual machine is is going to be right. Okay. Oh, I forgot a few things. Oops. I also need to have an instruction pointer, like which instruction is the, is the VM actually running right now. Uh, uh, return pointer. A call, uh, let's call it, yeah, call. And a stack pointer. I mean, these names are all kind of arbitrary, but all right, so. Uh, so this is going to be our virtual machine that we're going to compile to. How many minutes do I have left? Ten. Jesus Christ. Uh, uh, so now we have to figure out a way to run all these bytecodes, right? So uh, the bytecode. Uh, so let's see. Um, I'm going to start now. Okay, so first I'm going to put my instruction pointer to the to address one. Address zero is going to be like the crashing address, just in case something goes wrong. Uh, the stack pointer is going to be also at one. <laughs> Let's uh, wait. I didn't call that. Uh, 
shorten this because otherwise it's just not going to be. Uh, <laughs> Right, uh, and then I'm gonna have to do a loop going over my bytes. Right, this is called a threading loop. Um, threading has nothing to do with like I'm just gonna like bail out in case it breaks. Right. Uh, What I'm doing here is I'm saying, okay, if I'm running this code, it gets at most a thousand cycles before it stops, uh, or, or the call pointer is empty. Uh, so, so up code is going to be my uh, right. And that's my current up code because that's what my machine is pointing to, um, and then. Uh, I have to go back a bit. Oh. I'm going to have to interpret this. So it's going to say this is either going to be a primitive. What I haven't really explained yet, what I forgot to explain, is how am I going to differentiate user words, uh, defined words, from built in words, right? So the way I'm going to do that is going to say, well, I have these primitives. Uh, they're going to be the first built-in number of words. So if says then primitives dot length, I know it's primitive. It's a built-in word, right? And else, it's an address to a user word. Uh, in which case, I do something else. Oh, and if it's, in which case, I can do. I have what? Can you add 10 new lines to the bottom? Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah, right. Um, and otherwise, it's an address. But of course, I cannot. If I address uh, just like that, then I have a problem because then like, my primitives are going to occupy the first primitive number of bytes. So I'm going to subtract bytes from the opcode. Okay. Um, and then. Well, it's an address, so then I should just do this, right? It's a new address, and then I continue, right? Because then I just jump to this new address, which is then the new sequence of things. So I'm, I'm just going to take this other picture, even though it's not measured. Imagine this is a, a word address, and this is a word address, and this one points to here. So now this is interpreted as an address. It says, okay, just put my instruction pointer here and continue. And then it starts reading and continuing from here. And this may be an address that goes to here. And then it just keeps jumping. So you can just like keep jumping back and forth. It's just, it's calling without having a special call instruction. Now I need to in introduce the actual return pointer thing. Oh, six minutes, this is never gonna work. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put the uh, return flag, I'm gonna Insert it in my opcode. So the lo lowest bit is the actual return flag. Uh, so I'm going to say uh, and then code so it's going to be shift is one to the right. So I'm just going to take the lowest bit, that's my flag, is this returning or not? And then the rest is uh, shift is one to the right to be the actual address or primitive. <laughs> All right, and then uh, then pm dot ip is I go I the store the address I stored on the I keep calling it rp because that's what I had it in the other one. Restore on return stack. So what I hit here, when I just like uh, assign this, I just made it, I just made a jump around, right? But a call is actually not a jump. A call is store my current address, jump to somewhere else, until you hit a point of return, and then you return and then you store the old address. 
So what I need to add here is um, a return stack. Uh, what was it? Uh, and then, uh, well, I'm not going to do any checks now. I had lots of like safety checks, but it's not important right now. <laughs> And then uh, right, I'm gonna well, I'm gonna increase my return stack pointer to the next point afterwards. So that's not not point to the next thing. And if I re restore, I, I read it out. I first go back and I, so this this all synchronizes. Uh, what did I forget here? I forgot something here. Um, take this out and put it here actually and so this is the basic heart of a threading loop I can now put a bunch of code in there bytecodes they can call other uh, words that I defined which are just addresses and they can um, uh, call primitives and this super little piece of code is basically all you need for that. Um, well, of course you have to do it without any typos in there, but uh, so um, here is like the more final version because I also added like conditionals and literates and stuff like that. I'm not going to ty keep typing because I know I don't have time to explain the rest and I only have three more minutes. Um, but uh, yeah, it can get a lot more complex. Also, I put a lot of um, uh, like exception checks in there. But uh, uh, that that uh, start is the heart of it. And let me open for a second another file. Here is that same threading loop implemented in just 19 bytes. Of assembly or almost the same actually this does more because this is a language that has three stacks instead of one so you can really do this in absolutely nothing which is why you can do this on such a low level of hardware um, all right so uh, since I don't really have time to uh, show all the other stuff like by live typing it, I'm just gonna scroll through it. Uh, what you need to do after this is you need to implement all the primitives. I have like a bit of templating code to just um, map these words to the JavaScript code, and then at the end I create them with. Uh, I, I, I wasted way too much time on this, but anyway, um, I create a like function using um, uh, JavaScript's uh, <laughs> ability to create a function at runtime. Um, and then the point is at the end you get a whole bunch of callbacks, a bunch of JavaScript functions that you can just call like I did earlier in this um, primitive thing. Uh, now you still need to uh, actually compile the language. I haven't gone around to that. I just gave you the starting point as the VM, which actually runs the bytecode you have at the end. Right? Now you still need to map your text to um, a VM. Well, what you can do is you can just use in JavaScript, you can split tokens and you can just split it like on white space, but I actually want to keep track of the lines and columns so I can debug it. Yes, this thing has debugging support. <laughs> um, so I made a, a little uh, get token uh, function. It's all overly complicated because I had a week and I just got sidetracked. But the point is, I just say, is the white space? Yes. Then I continue. If it's not a white space, I stop and then I continue until I hit a white space. And then I have this length of code. This is like this is a token. This is a substring that I'm going to interpret. One thing at a time. Um, similarly for numbers, once I have a token, I just throw it at JavaScript and say, well, just type coerce it to a number. If it's not like a none, then it's a number, done. So I don't have to think about this any further, <laughs> right? So uh, I start with, um, this is basically my, my uh, opcode list, and it starts with an invalid address, like I said, 
address zero is a crash address on purpose because then I can easily make it crash if I want to. Um, I advance to the next token. Ah, time is out. Oh, wait for this. You can get the rest in the sequel. <laughs> I can show you the, the the code that came out of it, or the here. I have a question. Yeah. Can you show the code that came out of it? Yes. Thank you. Uh, so this is the language that came out of this. Um, uh, it has line comments, which you can just say like, hey, I, I, I separate by white space. Is this word like two dashes? Then I continue until I hit a new line and I just ignore that. So just like, that's, that's easy. You don't need a complicated parse for that. This is like, you take a token and you say, is the first character an open parenthesis? Yes. Then I'm going to keep going until I hit either a closing parenthesis or if I hit the second open parenthesis, I just like increase a counter. And once the counter is up, then I stop and I continue. So you can very easily have these types of comments. No complex grammar needed. It's just like scan forward. Uh, well, this is what I already explained, the stack machine stuff. Um, right, so... Uh, so now I define the word print oh yeah, because this number just happens to be printed as oh yeah if you print it in base 36. Because I don't have strings yet, so I had to do something, right? <laughs> um, so I push this on the stack and then you know, print base 36 uh, and return. So this is now a word you can call. Now most words are not called, like they don't, this, the way I implemented this is like it doesn't call the words as it's defined. You actually have to call the VM with the name of the word you want to call. So I call the VM with main and it says, okay, I'll, I'll look for whatever main is in the memory of opcodes, of the, of the final opcodes, and then I'm going to run this stuff. So main prints, oh yeah, then it prints 3b, this is the address where we are right now, which is basically the same thing. Um, so let's see how that works. Uh, oh yeah, 3b. Yes. Let me just quickly check if the Jitsi site at least... Um, yeah, people can hear me. That's good. <laughs> I didn't even check at all. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Yeah, any other question? Uh, so that one plus two yeah. instruction is just like dead code somewhere in there. Yeah, exactly. This is just dead code. Nice. Uh, <laughs> yeah, this all becomes... It's like a list of bytecodes. And I save the addresses where the, name, the word definitions are an external list. And then I say, okay, I call this word. You just like, just jump to this instruction and just keep going from there. Mm -hmm. So you can kind of see how simple this is to implement. Uh, conditionals, that's, I implemented this last afternoon. Uh, I didn't have time to implement if and else. So what I did is like, ah, I'm just going to put another flag on there. I got 32 bits and I'm never going to have like four gigabytes worth of code. Because that's how many bytes of code you can encode that way. I'm just going to say, look at the first uh, letter of the word. If it's a question mark, it's a conditional word, which means it looks at the stop. It takes the top point uh, data element of the stack. If it's zero, it's false. If it's not zero, it's it's true, and it only gets called if it's true. So, uh, in this case, this prints to uh, heads, and this prints to tails in base 36. Um, so like this is like this is oh wait did it no this is something else I don't even know what this is I think uh, called and skipped or something so this is this is called because there's a one here this is skipped because there's a zero mm -hmm. then I'm gonna um, flip nine coins three times which nine coins calls three coins and this is a flip coin mm -hmm. what does flip coin do it takes a random function. Zero, between zero and one, a floating point. I support floating point numbers too. Um, I convert that to uh, 932. So it's either it gets rounded properly to either one or zero because it's between zero and one. Then I duplicate it. So I have like, um, I don't know why that was necessary. Oh, I just wanted to keep track of the output. And I say, is it a one? Then I print heads and return. But if not, I don't do anything. So I also don't return. And then I fall through to the print tails. 
So on a 1 I print the heads, and on a 0 I print the tails. So let's see what we get. Uh, oh, the any column is part of the return statement. Yeah, oh, wow. it's not the return statement. There is no separate return statement. Every word itself returns or not by having a semicolon at the end, uh -huh. which gets converted to a return flag on the opcode. Oh, that's an interesting combination of the question yeah. So here you have uh, uh, yeah tails, heads, uh, tails four times, heads, tails two times. So yeah, it seems to be quite random and, uh, and conditional. Yeah, like... Um, also, what's kind of funny about this is that uh, by inserting it the way I did, I get tail calls for free. I don't know if you know what tail calls are. Like if you have a recursive code and and it's like you make it call itself unconditionally, you tend to hit this thing called the stack overflow, right? Your, your program says like, yeah, run out of memory. So what we're doing in our interpreter that I showed you is I first return from the word and then I call the next one. So if I return, if I call a returning word, I already return to the previous word. So I kind of skip. I don't blow up my stack. It always stays in one point if I loop. I don't really explain this properly right now. But basically, you get loops for free. Um, oh, look there. That's the third uh, <laughs> tutorial I wrote. Loops and tail calls. Um, yeah, so here's what I do. I have... Uh, print loop um, uh, this is like this this is the loop for printing uh, I subtract one from whatever's on the stack duplicate print it uh, duplicate and if it's not zero it gets consumed and I call itself again so then I continue and if it is zero then I'm done and I have a, a no instruction thing to return because otherwise I, I can't I can't return this way because if I did that, then um, I would just fall through if I don't call it. I need a separate return instruction at the end. So main calls print 20 to 1, which is here. This just falls through. Oh, I didn't explain that part yet. Like, words don't really end with a semicolon. A semicolon just says, if you call this word, you return. So if I don't have a semicolon here, then this definition just keeps going into the next definition. So this is just, it's kind of like what you can do in assembly, if you're familiar with that. It just, just falls through, or like a switch statement, except on a functional level. So, yeah, this uh, produces 20 to 1 in the console. Yeah, um, yeah let's go into this floating point thing. Um, like I said, this, uh, this is already the text I just explained. So, three sort of ends here because there's no way it can ever go beyond here. But in terms of bytecode, it doesn't care. There is no like start and end point of a function. A function is just a starting, it's like, it just says this is the starting address and then do whatever follows after. And you can follow. Uh, so yeah, I can like 12 is five. Uh, plus 7, which I also defined right here. I can call those words separately. And this way, what you can do is you can actually compress your code a lot. This is also a trick people use in assembly to compress their code. Uh, but here you can just do it in a higher level language, because the higher level language maps almost directly to the assembly, which in our case is a virtual machine. But there are also fours that map directly to an actual CPU that's made for a fourth, which does similar things. <laughs> Um, yeah, and you can do some quite crazy stuff this way. Um, I mean, this is not so crazy. Uh, this is like a nice example of of, refact of, of using fourth. It's like I can define words uh, in terms of other words um, to, for example, make time conversion very easy. If you want to convert time to milliseconds, you can say, well, uh, a week is seven days, a day is 24 hours. Uh, which should be hour here, I guess. An hour is 60 minutes, a minute is 60 seconds, um, a second is 1,000 milliseconds. And I, I multiply at the end, right? It's like 1,000 times uh, milliseconds times... So you could say hours. You get the time. Yeah, like that. So because, you can, because you can fall through, I can just say hour and, and hours. 24 hours. Yeah, 
Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Grammatically yes. <laughs> so, so then you can like uh, write like zero weeks, two days, one hour, 60 minutes, and seven seconds. And you add it all up and you print it. Oh, this is genius, I love this. This is very, yeah, it's very readable, right? Despite mapping almost directly to, to assembly, it's, it's very readable. And what I said earlier with the fall through is like, because this all, this calls a word, right? This uh, The second calls the millisecond, the minute calls the second. So you have like this quote unquote massive call overhead. If like of one a week, I call a day, which calls an hour, which calls a minute. But with the fall through, I just yeah, define it like this. Nah, you need a code, or you need a. Oh, yeah. Ugh, uh, it two just. Minutes. Yeah. For the people online, we just have a alarm problem. <laughs> oh, it's the alarm. Yeah, at eight o'clock the alarm goes off if mm. someone's inside. Mm. Nice. Like a week just becomes a straight stream of like multiplication. A day is just a straight stream of multiplication. So it's. It has lower overhead. It's not the same as like a compiler that says, hey, this is all constants. I can compile this way to one number. But it's also way simpler to implement, right? I don't have to um, deal with that. And what's, what's a bit crazy about my language is it's a, a compiled ahead of time, which means I can define words, uh, call words that are defined later. Uh, like force don't let you do that. You have to define a word first and only then can you call it. But my language just lets you do it because it's ahead of time compiled. So I can call a word I define later and then fall through to that word immediately to kind of have a sort of fractal word, like this calls print four times random, which calls print two times random and then falls through to print. Like, you see how this adds up, right? This actually is eight calls to a random, which is then printed. So let's see what the results of this are. Yeah. These do indeed look like random uh, numbers to me. Uh, and this apparently is uh, the amount of milliseconds that you would spend in zero weeks, two days, one hour, 60 minutes, and seven seconds. I'll, I'll take the computer's word for it. <laughs> um, yeah, what else did I still implement? Uh, I mean, I'm not saying it's always readable like this. I know what's going on here, but I can totally understand if you look at this and say, like, what the hell, dude? <laughs> but this produces Fibonacci uh, in the loop um, because it didn't get around to uh, implementing, like, looping constructs. And I, I made it loop, like, it, it basically adds more Fibonacci numbers on the stack until it overflows into a negative number. That's the test uh, here because it's like an in 32 so apparently we can at most uh, have 45 Fibonacci numbers on the stack before we run out of bits. Um, yeah. Wait, what is over defined? Over is a built-in word. Uh -huh, okay. Yeah, so uh, over is a classic uh, stack word. Actually, I can show you that because I did have one bonus slide. Uh, here. Because everything I just mentioned is like it, it only works if the top number on your stack is what you want, right? If, and if your top, the, num the, the number you want to use is somewhere below in the stack, you have to get access to it. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the main difference between a fourth and like a classic language. Is the, in classic languages, you assign to a variable and then later you can pull it back up. In, in cat language, I mean, you can do that. They are like, you, you have to, not in my language because I didn't get around to it, but you can create variables and save it. But it's kind of like, you don't need that, come on. You got a stack, you have to uh, learn how to swap uh, data around on the stack. So if you don't need the top item, you just drop it. So that's a word to drop the top item. If you don't need the second item, you say nip. So you just cut away the second item. If you want to swap it, it's a swap. Uh, for the three, you can rotate or dig or minus rotate or bury. You can kind of see what's going on here, right? By the color code. So these are all the classic um, names for um, stack manipulation. And as you see, they kind of just go to four because really it's kind of the sweet spot. Like if, if you need more than four items on the stack, that's the point where you're kind of allowed to go like, ah, I think I'll better use a variable for this. 
If it's less than four items, you usually can get away with just a few stack shuffle words. And it's, it's a bit of a mind bendy thing at first, but you get used to it. Kind of like the, the postfix notation as well. Um, yeah, so that's a that, yeah, good question, what the over was, that's, that's this. So it over means that you take the second item and you put it on, add it to the top? Yeah, because right. dub just takes the top item, mm -hmm. but over takes the... Uh, second one. Yeah. The top, yeah. Uh, there is, uh, you, can, you can implement these in other versions of them, actually. Um, for example, tuck takes the top item and puts a copy below the second item, right? What you can do is, uh, you can say swap and then over. So look here, if you swap this and then you over, you get this back on top, then you get the effect of the same result, see? Mm -hmm. So like a lot of, the, you, you actually don't need all of these words. You can define these words, like, I don't know which ones you actually need for the core, but you don't need a few core primitives, then you can re-implement all the others as a sequence of them. So you can really build this up from really minimal things. Mm. I'm a bit sad, I, I mean I only had a week so I knew this was crazy, but I was actually planning to um, attach this to um, HTML elements, because I made, I made it in such a way that it doesn't run any of these words until you call the VM with the name of the word, right? So if you know JavaScript, that just means I can say, I'm just going to make a word called uh, on mouse and have some code that does something. And then I'm going to create an event that reacts whenever the mouse does something. And then I'm going to call my VM with on mouse. And then it returns whatever's on the stack at the end. And I can do this with all the other events too. So I can actually already interface this with uh, my browser. Like that's already done Like just because of that. That's a very simple thing. Um, so yeah, I don't really know what else to say. Maybe there's some, uh... <laughs> someone in the chat here says, the talk was too fired that it triggered the fire alarm. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. No, I, thank you. <laughs> um, um, I don't know what else to say. Anyone in the, the Discord chat want to say something like that I forgot to bring up that's cool for the small crowd of six other people that I'm trying to convert here. <laughs> no? Well, um, I'm open to any questions. Or... So so this this language was the CAT22 language, which is a concatenative language. Yeah. What is it? This slide here, is that what's common for all uh, concatenative this languages? Is, uh, this is a terminology that originated from fourth. So fourth, um, well, some of the names come from other languages, um, but uh, fourth, it's a bit ironic. It's, it, was, it was invented by this guy called Chuck Moore. Um, there's a really cool presentation by uh, someone who calls himself Red Factor. Uh, I, can l I will link that um, and uh, yeah, share it with you. If you're not all in the chat though, but I don't know. We'll figure that out later. Um, but uh, he came up with these words for his language, or a number of them. And then, so the ironic part is, from in his point of view, you should mold this language to your own needs. And I think you can kind of see from what I've shown so far, it's very easy, because you can just define words to become whatever you want. Uh, it becomes, it's very easy to just make like lots of very tiny words uh, that then read like it's almost English. Um, but then somewhere, I don't know if it was the late 70s or early 80s, for, they got a fourth standard. And Chuck Moore was like, that's, that's not the point. You don't need a standard. <laughs> but in the standard, you got all these words. And that's kind of like been um, yeah, the shared vocabulary. And yeah, there's a, it's, it's useful because it makes it easy for me to talk with someone else who's into this kind of stuff. And we know what we're talking about. There's, it's good to have a shared standard. But I also agree with Chuck Moore that it's cool to do your own thing. Like my my design of having the colon at the end, the semicolon, that's not common. I've seen one or two languages do something similar. Like I, I, I stole it, it was not my original idea. I saw it in this fourth called Retroforth, which in 
the term was inspired by Chuck Moore's color fourth, but um, the first time I saw that, I saw this is so smart because what most fourths do is they put everything in just the word means just that and there's no other meaning. So you have to do a lot of other things, like you have to use multiple word definitions to get some things in there. And here you can, with the changes I made, you can make it, um, I don't know, read a bit more English <laughs> or programming languages for others. Um, so you can uh, do it that way too. You can say, well, I, I kind of miss this feature from C or whatever, and I'm just going to add that even though it's not traditional, the thing that you do in character languages. Does that answer your question? I kind of went to my sidetrack there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Are those cat and cons? That's the same concept like in Lisp, right? Yeah. Um, because uh, like I've read about Lisp before, or like I've tried Lisp and stuff, but I don't think I've ever understood exactly what they wanted me to do with cat and cons in their life. <laughs> I saw this, this uh, presentation there. Maybe I can... Oh, I wish I'd bookmarked it. Uh, Ah, uh, this is not, not at all. So, uh, here, this is Manfred von Thun, who is not Austrian but Australian. Um, or, well, at least that's where he worked. Uh, he came up with a language called Joy. Um, he, um, he was, I think, the first, or at least one of the first, to really connect stack languages to uh, mathematical combinators. I don't know if you know what combinators are, but like it's a... Uh, uh, well, wait, like when you have like a number of items and you need to pick one of them? Yeah, like those kind of things. It, it, I have to say, I don't like really... Like you use that kind of notation in the game. Yeah, I'm not, so, I'm not so good with that either. This is why I just did the slow level style thing, because that's more my jam. Like, <laughs> um, but what he did is like, you take the whole language thing, and then he introduced a concept called the quote, so uh, you can make a list of words and, and, cl and cl close them in brackets and then they're not called um, until you explicitly say just call this list of words and then uh, in, in joy um, you kind of do everything by combining these lists of words these quotes so an if statement which is for some reason not here uh, come on show me a uh, what language? Or I can see. Oh. Enter the mirror. <laughs> Don't mind if I do. Um, that's, yeah, that's not what I. Ah, tutorial, that, that would help. So we were the if statement is. There must be an if somewhere. <laughs> because that's like the part where you can like understand yeah. what's going on. <laughs> so, okay. Um, if x is zero, then one else x times factorial. Like this is like the traditional C-like language syntax, right? Right. So here he has a code that says zero equals. So like is this equal to zero? It says pop one, so just remove one, or pop the thing from the stack, yeah, take it off of the stack. and then put one on there, I guess. Uh, and the other one is duplicate it on the stack, put one on the stack, subtract one from it, and then call factorial, and then multiply. Okay. And then you have the word if then else. Okay, if then else first applies this uh -huh. to the stack, and then says, okay, if it is true then i'm gonna do this one and if it's not true i'm gonna do this one so the way it does branching is like okay you apply this one first and if it's true then i then i apply this one and if not then i apply the other one so it uses like these quotes to do everything and then it kind of builds all these things with um uh, ah, so the first pop is you take the x right right okay i understand 
So during the first pulse you get the X and then after that you repeat the yeah. subtract one and multiply. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. So uh, So this is mathematics. Um, mm -hmm. he he did not actually have a working implementation for a large part of his design. It was all like logic and stuff. And then it started to get attention and traction and then he sadly passed away <laughs> just as it became mm -hmm. a thing. Um, so it's just it's like, um, you know, the true believers in the Discord server of concatenate programming <laughs> still love it, but it's a bit forgotten outside of it, sadly. It will, uh, it will get smacked. Um, yeah, so, so the com uh, to get back at your question, which was, what are, what are these things? Well, which, as I said, I also don't quite understand because I never really got into the mathematical side of it too much, but I think it's more related to those kind of... Um, to operations. Yeah. Like oh, you know what I think? The white the white outline means it's a quote. So it means it's... It's a container. Yeah, it's the container. So it's like, it's the unapplied bit of the, uh, code. So... Uh, so... Um, if I say cat compose, then I put both of these separate containers into one container, which you can then run later together if you want. Mm -hmm. Cons mm -hmm. means put this in, put this outside word into the container. Identity means unpack this container. Unit means put it in a container. Dip means swap, unpack and swap, uh, swap, I guess. And yeah. So you can kind of see how this Right, so this is about working on containers. And yeah, on, on quotes. So the terminology in Joyce quotes. Right, because like like the lists in, in lists. When yeah, have a yeah, exactly. Ah, yeah. wow, okay, now I understand what I'm saying. <laughs> okay. Like, I'm, I'm like uh, 40 minutes over time, by the way. I'm really, uh, this is just questions. We yeah, yeah, of course. Thank you. That's it. I'm, I'm glad. That's oh, part I'm so, of the format. I'm so positively uh, surprised the oldest interest. Uh, or not, I mean, I shouldn't be because I know it's great stuff, but uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, the topic, not my presentation, my goodness. <laughs> Any other, uh, yeah. What does the future for CAT 22? Is it done now? Will you. No, I, I, I have so it? much fun with it. Yeah, nice. Like, I. Uh, so I want to, uh, well, like I said, I want to make it uh, react to events. Although that part is quote-unquote easy, because it just means put a JavaScript closure around the VM and run whatever word definition I used. Um, so I could kind of postpone that. I actually would like to have a proper if statement in there, and a proper looping statement. And because uh, then it's a lot more ergonomic. Um, and uh, then I think I might try... So I just realized something on the way here. Um, because the way I set it up is that when a program ends, whatever data is left on the data stack gets returned as an array. So if I like have a program one, two plus, and I end the program, it returns the array with one element that says three, right? So I can actually get extract results from it that way. So I could do compile time evaluation in this in cat 22 by making it like having a special comp time word and then say like okay comp time from here to there extract this bit of string run a new vm <laughs> separately and then whatever result is in comes out of that you can kind of insert in a particular way back into it and then you just continue the program so then i have like macros by just the interpreter running another the compiler running another vm on the side before continuing so that sounds like fun. I want to do that. Uh, and it shouldn't be too much work because I already have a running VM, right? So that's, that's fun. Mm -hmm. And once I got that, uh, I could do, for example, constant folding. So one plus, one, two plus, I could turn into a three. I'm trying to detect that. I could do, um, yeah, there's so much fun stuff out there to explore. And the thing is, if you want to do this in other languages, there is so much boilerplate to build around it. But once you get down to this kind of pretty stuff, it's much more fun. Um, it's much more straightforward, I would say. Not fun. I also think it's fun. Um, 
I can also show you some other languages other people have made, if you're curious, which do things very differently. In case, uh, fourth or fourth like? Uh, fourth like, or just like they're concatenative but not fourth like. Uh -huh, okay. So, um, yeah, that, that, that would be interesting to see what the greater space of the concatenative okay. languages are. So, um, let's see. Uh, I'm going to open the Discord here and just pick a fourth. Ah, that's uh, not a fourth, pick a language. So, So Factor, have you ever heard of Factor? No. no. So this one is uh, one of the more well-known um, uh, concatenative languages after fourth and I would say UXN more recently. Um, it's, uh, it's language originally started by a guy called Slava Pestov who was then recognized for his talents and scouted by Apple, so he stopped working on this and now works on Swift instead. <laughs> Um, and he also, like in the early 2000s or late 2000s, he even gave a talk at Google about this uh, language, which I think actually had some novel uh, optimization strategies and stuff that data got incorporated into V8. So, mm. if I remember correctly, so this I think this has been sort of like mildly influential among language implementers at least. Um, let's see if I can get a nice. Yeah, so here you can like you can import stuff like they have standard library. It's it's a very batteries included language. It's garbage collected. Uh, it has things like you can make lists and arrays, um, and it has a very very complete standard library, and it uh, exists for all platforms really. Um, this is like if you want to have an accessible batteries included starting point, then this is this is a pretty good one, I would say. Um, it also has like interactive development, which I cannot really easily demonstrate right now, but if you've ever seen a small talk or a Lisp, this is also like a nice REPL with also built in documentation. You can just click on things and stuff. It's very, um, yeah, it's very fun life coding. Um, okay, maybe UXN is a uh, more recent one. Oh, this is the emulator. That's not useful. Oh, I've, I've seen this one. UXN, yeah, it's. Uh, that one, uh, I just, I'm just gonna put this on a different screen for a second. I cannot. I cannot read it on the present. Uh, yeah. So. UXN is a, a language uh, created by uh, Devin, uh, if I pronounce his name correctly. Um, and so he was a, he still is, he's an artist and he was working on a, a game with his partner and they were using Unity at first while also sailing uh, across the seas where you have bad internet. And then they realized this is not going to work with the way they want us to install gigabytes for updates all the time and breaking things. And also after a few years they realized we can't even continue our old projects because the new Unity breaks with the old stuff. Mm -hmm. So then he decided I'm going to make the most minimal implementation of a language that actually is built to last and also can work on old retro hardware and doesn't need gigabytes of data. And he came up with this, which is also a stack language because it has all those nice features. Um, and it, it's quite a, uh, so this is Hello World, uh, I hope this, it's also run ahead of time, and it, uh, yeah, this is like, it assembles live in the browser and then creates a thing. I don't know why it doesn't actually print it though, maybe there's a bug, or maybe my browser is messing it up. Um, uh, I don't think it's very easy to just immediately show from the, this is like the documentation, but it has things like lambdas and stuff, even though it's super low level, um, and it, 
So this one looks like this. I don't know what all these sigils do. Like I never really, I, I went to a tutorial once and then I didn't keep it and then I forgot, you know. And then, but the thing is that, like you said, it's, it's, it has super small ROMs because it converts, like it compiles to very small bytecode. Um, it has a super simple small emulator that you can make work on like, like a Game Boy Advance even or stuff like that. Uh, so his games are basically portable to everything that can run his emulator. Because he uses a virtual machine, and he also designed the, the op like it's he uses actual bytecode, so his operations are one byte. And I think he, three of those are flags, and five of those are actual operations. So then he has thirty-two separate instructions, only thirty-two built-in instructions. That's all he needs. Um, and then on he builds a virtual machine around it that also has like input and output and screens and stuff like that. But um, yeah, that's him build very small compact games in it. Um, yeah, I want to show modal, but I don't know where the website is from the top of my head. I know it's, I know here's a very nice, um, Ah, uh, but this like modal is some is like another. Yeah, but it's on the probably around like the same top level web program. Uh, or just go to slash now and it's mentioned there. Ah, here. So modal is I think it's concatenative because it's on the Discord server for concatenative languages. <laughs> um, so it it works completely different than what everything I just showed you. It doesn't have any stacks or whatever. Uh, it's uh, it's based on string rewriting. Uh, I haven't gone too far into it, other than that whenever I see a snippet of code, I think this looks very straightforward. Um, it's basically, imagine if like formal grammars were not a pain in the ass to read, <laughs> then you kind of get uh, close to this. So it has a bunch of rules. And it applies it to your an input string and then it produces like it keeps applying those rules until it's like there's no more rule to apply this is your final string um and like, it's very minimal it has rules uh registers and sequences and the funny thing is that's all you need to be able to define computation so you can actually define computation in terms of string writing rules uh, I think the creator is actually in the chat. Oh, I'm too zoomed in. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I should have looked at it. I'm so sorry, guys. I'm not looking at the chat. Um, yeah, OK. Uh, it's too, too far back that I can't. Like, their comments make no sense anymore. I'm sorry, uh, <laughs> I don't know how to pronounce your name, actually. Um, so, so here is a rule. Uh, you have an input program, and then you have the result of applying the rule number four. Uh, so here, if you rule the the, the rule says hello uh, and then buy. So it basically means if you see the word hello, you rewrite it to buy. My input string is hello world, and the resulting string is buy world. Sim simple enough, right? But then um, you can actually create like new notation with these rules. So you define uh, so this is like this is like a temporary variable that only exists during the rewrite. So that's a register, right? Uh, so what happens here? You have if you have the string uh, with two wildcards x and y that looks like this, then you produce a string that looks like this instead. So uh, Apple uh, A apple B uh, two banana apple banana fruit salad. So if type in A B, then first it converts A to apple, then it converts B to banana, and then it converts this whole thing to fruit salad. Right. And I kind of forget to explain why it's uh, concatenative, <laughs> but like one of the key definitions of concatenative is that you can. Like, I have I have not explained at all what concatenative is. Concatenative means like I can cut my program at any point in my source code and produce a valid program. 
because it just reads from left to right, because it just takes the stack, in, no, in my language, the stack as input and produces stack, it always produces a valid program. If I have one, two, plus, it produces the program, um, it produces three. But if I just, if I throw away the, if I cut it in two and you say one, uh, two plus, then I have a, a program that takes whatever stack you throw into it and produces a stack that adds two to it, the two added to it, right? So you can kind of chop up your code any way you like, which makes it super easy to refactor words. You can just like lift this subsection of code into a new word definition and just like replace that original section with the new definition. So refactoring is super easy in this language, in, in comparative language as a result. That's also why factor is called factor, because it's short, short for refactoring. And, and that's one of those like superpowers of it. Like if I want to refactor a bit of code in a C language, I have to like put a whole bunch of boilerplate around it in the form of like a new function definition and whatnot. In um, a language like Cat22, you just like, okay, here's a new name, colon, and I copy paste the part that I want to have in my new definition, semicolon at the end, and then I paste the name back into the place where it started. And it's the exact same in the fourth. So that's like, it makes refactoring really easy and it's encouraged. Okay, so this is also concatenative, but I haven't gotten into it far enough to actually know why, but I believe the creator only says it's concatenative. <laughs> um, so you can like do, this, this is super fun, but uh, this like, it's not a 20 minute talk all by itself. But at some point you can like, you can make truth tables, you can, um, you can do arithmetic with pure string writing tools, uh, rules, um, prefix to infix, uh, higher order functions, type systems, substrings, like, uh, yeah, so modal, like reverse the list and it becomes in the end lado with these, these rules. Like you can do all kinds of fun with it. Um, and it's, this is the most recent C implementation. It's actually not that big. It's smaller than my language. <laughs> so, uh, Speaking of your language, uh, is it published uh, anywhere? Yes, I put the demo website on, um, on New Cities. So you can just open the website and it's view source. <laughs> that's, that's my way of publishing. Like, I, don't, I don't take pull requests for this. It's like too small. Uh, What's the URL? Huh? Can you put the URL? Yeah, uh, I can, but as you can see here, it's like, uh, yeah. we, we, can't, we can't zoom in on the actual URL bar. Um, let's see if I can find a workaround for that. Let's put it in the HTML of the H1. You can zoom in if you're in Windows. Which one? I have too many windows open. Okay, here. Uh, oh, this is the home the one at home. I have to update the one. Um, uh, that's not the one I want, though. Here. Yeah, so this is the... I have to update this because it doesn't have the newest thing in there, but... So that's CAC 22. Uh, it may be a reference to a book. Maybe a reference to my daughter who was born in 22, which is the year of the tiger. Uh, it's like you can pick whatever you prefer. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that was like fun on CAC 22. Yeah, yeah, that might also be. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of how I felt when I was like, when it was Sunday and I still wasn't remotely done with my language. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, Any other applause? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That's the presentation, guys. I'm going to uh, mute now and stop the recording. I'm saying it to them. I'm gonna...